Danny, no. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Business Blaze. This episode of Business Blaze has a sponsor, which is obviously fantastic. I mean, for me. Babbel is all about learning languages. Look, here on Business Blaze, we speak the language of business. Not really. If you're new here, this channel isn't really about business, and I don't know why it's called Business Blaze anymore. I do wonder about myself. Uh, But Babbel is all about learning a different sort of language, the languages that you're more familiar with, like the ones that we speak in different countries. (laughs) There's lots of reasons you might need to learn a language. Professional, personal, travel. Well, I'd say travel is sort of a personal reason, but uh, or maybe you're traveling for work. Maybe you're uh, going to negotiate. Maybe you're like a high-level diplomat and you're going to go negotiate with... Look, in, in that case, if you're going to negotiate with North Korea, they've probably got interpreters and stuff. But if you're doing like other sorts of travel... The worst ad read ever already. Look, you, there's lots of reasons to learn language because not everyone's just rolling around with an interpreter, okay? Uh, you might already tried to learn a bit uh, a language with some basic free apps from the App Store. Babbel isn't like that. Babbel is paid. But that's actually a good thing because, look, when you pay for something, it generally becomes better. Like right now, you might see this video being interrupted with a ton of adverts from, like, you know, uh, YouTube ads. But if you pay for YouTube Premium, you don't get them. This isn't an ad for YouTube Premium. I'm just trying to demonstrate that when you pay for something, it's better. Like with Babbel, there's no ads in the app. It's not like you're learning a language, like with one of these free apps, and it's like, oh, there's an ad for Raid Shadow Legends. You're like, oh, that is tempting. That is tempting. I might go do that instead. Don't do that. There's no distractions when it's a paid for app. Also, like those cheaper apps, obviously they've got a smaller development team. They've got less people working on it. So like while those might have crazy sentences, like I've used some of those apps, I've tried them. And it's like, the red shirt crosses the street. Spell this in this other language. And you're like, uh, what? What's going on? Whereas Babbel, they're designed by people. So that actually makes sense, which is useful. And it's not just an app, you can use it online. Look, mostly use the app. Let's say you might be, I don't know, sitting around waiting for an appointment or something, or you just got a few down minutes, maybe you're taking a shit, and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna whip out the Babbel app, do a little bit of language learning. Also, of course, you can use it on your computer as well. So start learning a new language with Babbel today. You get six months for half price. There is a link below. So this business place is about celebration. Walt Disney's Draconian Murder Town. Oh, there's a story behind this one. Hold on. <laughs> so uh, Danny and I, like, we have like a production management system where we discuss what we're going to be writing about and what videos we're going to make. And so Danny writes to me, I'm sure you've probably seen there's an annoying guy in the comments who spent the last few months asking us to look at the story of Celebration, Disney's failed town. I'll have to try, I'll try and have to, I'll try and find his name if we get to it. I don't know if Danny does. But it does sound like quite an interesting story. It was supposed to be Disney's, uh, a happy Disney World town, but it ended up as a creepy village with appalling schools, murders, suicides, <laughs> etc. Um, and I reply to this. Hey, Danny. Ha 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 ha. Uh, that's what I wrote. Normally, I purposefully don't do the ones that people ask for over and over again because I'm a dick. But this one does sound pretty fun. Approved. So, annoying commenter. <laughs> Here we go. You're welcome. I just had to get that digging early on because I don't want people posting the same shit over and over again. It actually means I'm less likely to make it. And if you start getting all demanding, I'm just gonna ban you. And people are like, ah, oh, Simon, you're infringing on his freedom of speech. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am. I don't care. I'm European, we don't believe in that. I never got a chance to visit a Walt Disney World Resort when I was a kid. Danny didn't. I did. I went many times. It was awesome. I don't say that to elicit sympathy. No one's feeling sorry for you, Danny. If anyone's feeling sorry for you, they're just feeling sorry that you're locked in the basement that you didn't get to go to Disney World. I don't think that I would have ever ever fancied going anyway. Oh, Danny, it's awesome. As much as I love the early Walt Disney classic films uh, and consider Pinocchio and Dumbo to be amongst the most beautiful films ever crafted, I never warmed to the idea of traveling thousands of miles to be patted on the head by people dressed up as Mickey Mouse and Goofy. Dude, oh, come on. You You were like, I don't know, when do kids find this entertaining? Five? years old, four years old, five years old, six years old, I don't know. And I'll see kids walking down the street and I'll be like to my wife, how old is that kid? She'll be like, I don't know, three, <laughs> maybe seven, <laughs> I don't know. I'm assuming as you have a kid and you see how, you know, how they look at different ages, you get, cause already I'm like, that baby's young, that baby is older which I couldn't do before. Besides, we had our own entertainment in Rotherham in the 80s and 90s. Every Thursday afternoon, and everyone flocked to see the latest public hanging in the town square, just opposite Woolworths. Danny's joking, obviously. We didn't execute people in the 80s and 90s. They used to hand out free potted meat sandwiches at halftime. Those were simpler days. I, I mean, it's funny, but it's also kind of f- up. 
Of course, although Walt Disney was still around to oversee the opening of the original Disneyland site in California in 1955, he never lived to see the completion of the much more ambitious Walt Disney World Resort in Florida in 1971. But in fact, even this was just one component of a much wider Florida project, which originally included plans to build Disney's very own Town of Tomorrow. I feel like I've made a video about this on. This is all very familiar to me, which normally means I've made a video about this on one of my other channels. And people are gonna be like, "So, I don't believe you can't remember you made a video about this three months ago." And whenever someone says that, I'm like, "You're clearly unaware of how many videos I make." <laughs> Sometimes I'll look and it'll be like, "There's a video I recorded last week," and I'm like, "I recorded that already." I know nothing about that. And although it took several more decades for Disney's fantastic dream to become a reality, it's fair to say that it ends up more like a nightmare on Elm Street than anything that the great animator himself would have drawn up. Before we go, I've never seen a nightmare on Elm Street. That surprises absolutely nobody. But before we go any further, we should just say that this topic idea was suggested, oh, here we go, by reviewer, uh, sorry, by viewer, Brian Cook, about 200 bloody times. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, just goes to show that perseverance can sometimes pay off. Danny, no! But Brian's original suggestion about covering the failed town of Celebration is open to questioning. I'm not convinced that the town project could be considered a complete failure, yet it certainly took some surprising and quite macabre twists and turns, which feel a million miles away from Donald Duck and the often overlooked Clarabelle Cow. What the f is Clarabelle Cow, Danny? In October 1966, again, people are gonna be like, Simon, you never heard of Clarabelle Cow? You never heard of Clarabelle Cow? <laughs> ah, you're so dumb. I don't care about backlash. Smash that dislike button. In October 1966, Walt Disney made a short film in which he unveiled some of his plans for Epcot. The experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Isn't Epcot that convention center in Los Angeles? Uh, I've been there for, for VidCon like two years ago. Obviously not this year. No one goes anywhere this year. There's nothing to do <laughs> except work. Disney had been secretly snapping up tens of thousands of acres of land in somewhere in Florida, or Ocelio County, who cares? The majority of which was earmarked for the planned new theme park resort. But it also set aside about 5,000 acres of land for the Epcot project. This would be an entire city inside a climate controlled dome, which would draw upon the very latest technology from the American industry. Instead of cars and buses, citizens would use a massive monorail, which would span the entire utopia. That does sound, isn't the weather in Florida? Florida really good though. It's like warm all the time. I mean, building, the, I guess, the big dome, you can like make it 20 degrees. But in that case, like, why not just go somewhere where the climate's a little bit more moderate? In Walt's own words, Epcot would be a real city that would never cease to be a blueprint of the future. Obviously, I've got this confused because if Epcot is in Florida, because there's the Epcot Center. I thought that was the one in Los Angeles, but I guess I'm wrong. I'm obviously wrong because, you know, Danny actually researches stuff and I just stand here and talk it. It's just the way it is. I'm not, I'm just a messenger. Walt Disney died from lung cancer just a few days after producing the promotional film, and although the Walt Disney World Resort would open its doors five years later, the whole Epcot project was put on ice indefinitely without Walt to drive it forward. It's possible that everyone else in the company just thought it was one of Walt Disney's sillier ideas, like Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Danny, I, there's so many references I don't get today. I'm like, what is, I feel like I've also done a video about uh, mentioning Oswald, like I've heard of it, but I have no idea what it's about. And, or maybe Danny's just brought it up before, or maybe it's a throwback to an OG Business Blaze joke, which I don't remember? I don't know. And it's interesting to ponder just how far Walt Disney may have gone in his quest for absolute power had he lived a little longer. A notorious control freak, it's often speculated that Walt Disney's ambitions went way beyond the building of pleasant little communities. He ultimately wanted to build a private Disney government in Florida uh, in charge of its own taxes and roads and public amenities. He wanted to erect a Disney kingdom with himself sitting on a glorious throne. It sometimes seems a shame. Seems a shame he couldn't just stick to drawing cartoons. I don't know, that sounds pretty awesome. Like, if you're rich and powerful, you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be king. Goals. <laughs> this is just the start. First, I make a lot of YouTube channels. Take over YouTube, take over the world. Although at the Epcot project gathered dust for decades, some bright spark at Disney decided to resurrect the idea in the early 1990s. They hadn't really done much with the 5,000 acres of land in the southern portion of the Reedy Creek Improvement District. The land was kind of just isolated from other Disney developments and wasn't really within walking distance of any of the theme parks. The nearest park was five and a half miles to Hollywood Studios. That is a distance. So Disney had always been faced 
with a dilemma over what exactly to do with this annexed land. By 1994, the company announced that they were investing $2.5 billion that is a lot of money into developing a new town called Celebration, a new utopian community inspired by Walt Disney's original vision, but without the cool monorail thing. Also, it was like 1994. When was the original one? Like 1950s or whatever? Yeah, it's like monorails are like, yeah, it's okay. I mean, isn't it just a railway with like one track that's elevated? It's like, why not put that shit underground? We have the technology. We've had the technology longer. It's obviously better if it's underground because then you don't have an ugly ass monorail riding around. Like underground metros. Metros are more popular for a reason. It's difficult to grasp if Disney were looking to the future or just looking to the past when they started building Celebration. It sounds like they were doing both, Danny. Although it was promoted as a state of the art town, it also appeared to build on a foundation of nostalgia. These words came from Disney's very own sale pitch. There was once a place where neighbors greeted neighbors in the quiet of summer twilight, where children chased fireflies and porch swings provided easy refuge from the cares of the day. The movie house showed cartoons on Saturday, the grocery store delivered, and there was one teacher who always knew you had that special something. Remember that place? That place doesn't exist. It's called nostalgia. Everyone's like, oh, you know, the 1950s is the classic example. It's like, yeah, 1950s in America, particularly like, oh, it's so rosy and everything's nice. And then it's like, yeah, except it was really racist. And wasn't everyone going to be blown up by nuclear bombs? <laughs> it's like, oh, it was so nice. It's not nice. Everyone thinks the past is better when the reality is that the present is almost always better than the past. Even with this COVID that's going on right now, that's better than most times in history <laughs> it really is. It's not, I mean, it's not better than like 2000 and I don't know. 18 or whatever but it's like it's better than you know the spanish flu the bubonic plague any of any of the major wars some of those words would come back to haunt disney okay chasing fireflies ended in trouble eh disney the first residents moved into the town in june 1996 after disney held a lottery for a chance to buy one of the first 474 homes oh my god people love disney so much like i'm on twitter and i see people like raving about disney like adults and i'm like i mean yeah Disney's cool and all that, but, but people would eat this shit up. New residents found what appeared to be an immaculate, picture-perfect town with candy-colored houses and gleaming white picket fences and old-world lanterns. There was barely a sign of any cars or garbage cans or anything that might be considered unsavory, as these were all hidden away in special lanes behind the homes. That's pretty clever. On a slightly surreal note, the town even had its own soundtrack of sorts. Muzak was constantly piped out to speakers hidden away in palm trees, and the set list had an unusual focus on Jolly Christmas songs okay now we're getting a bit dystopian and weird oh the postal workers must be driven insane you're like you're walking around delivering letters it's like i don't know what song that is but it sounds you know like music shut the fuck up and the postal workers go postal so even if it was the middle of june you'd often hear blasts of santa claus is coming to town as you popped down to the shops to buy some milk and cigarettes and painkillers yeah, you need it. In a similar fashion to one of Disney's own movies, it might have all just seemed a bit too good to be true. It's, all, it's sounding quite painful. And I, I also get the feeling it's one of those places where they frown upon drinking heavily. I'd be like, well, that's boring, isn't it? As you go down to the pub, it's like, oh, what's there? Oh, we got butterbeer. Oh, and that's not Harry. That's Harry Potter, isn't it? No! I don't know, whatever they drink in like Disney movies, because it's not beer, is it? And everyone knows beer is awesome. And that's largely because it was completely fake. Residents would wake up to the beautiful sound of the dawn chorus every morning, but it wasn't produced by real birds. The noise was coming from those hidden speakers in the palm trees. Snow would fall every day in winter, but those thick layers of snow accumulating on the rooftops weren't made up of real snow or even artificial snow. It was shaving cream. Oh no, why? It's no wonder the residents soon began questioning everything they saw and wondering if they'd somehow ended up in the Truman Show. <laughs> if I lived there, I'd get suspicious that I was possibly spending my Friday nights drinking fake beer from a fake bar populated by creepy automatons. Yeah, dude, this sounds weird. And it wasn't too long before the cracks in the gleaming facades started to show. Getting quite excited about this. Look, Kevin, or whatever your name was, this wasn't actually a bad suggestion. Um, just, I mean, <laughs> yet to ask so many times drives me insane. One of the problems with Disney's utopian combination of the glory days and the future is that it didn't appear to be a very 
diverse version of the future. Part of the reason they ran a random lottery for the first homes was supposedly to prevent racial discrimination against home buyers. But it didn't really work because the houses were so wildly expensive, they just got snapped up by affluent white people. <laughs> it's interesting to note that Disney was happy to donate $900,000 to Oskelio County, or whatever it's called, to help poor residents of the county buy houses under $80,000. But the starting price of a celebration house back then was $125,000. Wait, that seems like obvious and blatant discrimination, <laughs> guys. Do better! Yeah, yeah, we'll help you buy a house outside of our beautiful, pure, snowy white shaving cream town. <laughs> it's like f***ing hell, Disney, you dicks. So Disney seemed to be giving the impression they're willing to help poorer citizens get onto the property adder just anywhere except their fairy tale town. Yes. Oh, approximately 88% of Celebration's small population was white, in comparison to the surrounding county's 59% white population. Oh, Disney! Those who were rich enough to live in Disney's town found themselves restricted by some quite bizarre rules and regulations, which were conveyed in the town's 166-page community charter Designed to make life pleasant for everyone. I'd never read that shit. <laughs> that would not happen. I'd not live here. I want to live in the opposite of this. I want to live in like Mad Max town. I don't really. But this is way too good and Mad Max is way too bad. You know what, you know what works quite well? The real world. The first residents were required to attend workshop sessions to learn all about how to become a good citizen. There were rules on keeping your lawn at a certain height. What plants you were allowed to grow in your garden? I'd just be growing coca plants. What colors of curtains and blinds were acceptable? What color of mulch was permitted to be around the base of your trees? And how many people were allowed in a bedroom at one time? Oh my. <laughs> one school kid even got detention for walking to school. Even though she lived just around the corner, children were required to either catch the bus or get dropped off by their parents. Walking around the corner was strictly forbidden. Is Wayne Brady gonna have the choker bitch? <laughs> All right, steady on Disney. You worried about all those random pedophiles that you selected. <laughs> the Celebration School had its own share of problems, though. The $20 million establishment was an unusual K-12 model, taking kids in from kindergarten to the age of 12. But it seems that Disney was attempting to reinvent the typical American classroom with experimental new education techniques. Uh-oh. Instead of one teacher overseeing a class of 20 to 30 students of a similar age, the Celebration School saw three teachers taking charge of a sprawling class of over 80 students. All from completely different ages. <laughs> this makes no sense. Parents complain that the school is chaotic and the lessons seem to be a complete waste of time with serious academic shortcoming. <laughs> oh my. On top of that, traditional grading was thrown out of the class window in favors of teachers compiling ridiculously detailed report cards with blow by blow criticisms of every single failing of every single child. <laughs> a far cry from my own school reports, which seemed to be quite thin in comparison and largely consisted of single sentences such as, Who on earth is Daniel? <laughs> Are you sure he attends this school? <laughs> Oh, Danny, you've been bunking off. What did the Americans say? Someone told me when I said bunking off before. Like, was it playing hooky or something like that? That feels familiar. Ferris Bueller's Day Off is a movie I've seen. Mwah! It's a great movie. Whew. Yep. Um, what else did I want to say? Yeah, uh, getting report cards. We used to get pretty detailed report cards from school. And they'd come, like, you get them, I think it was six times a year. So, like, three big ones, like, at the end of each term. And they're three small ones every half term. And the first week of every holiday, like, when you're over school, was, like, dreading that the report card arrives. And you're like, oh, what are they going to say about me? I was often a good student, but I often was, like, I fluctuated wildly. Like, I'd have terms where it's just, like, I just didn't work. And there'd be another term where I worked really hard. So it was very up and down. One of the most notable landmarks of celebration became famous by tragic accident. Just a few kilometers south of the main town was a large pond, which was to become known as Death Pond. Oh God. Oh no. Danny, we've talked about this. Death isn't funny. We'll try. If you happened to take a wrong turn on your way in or out of the town, you would risk plunging straight into the water, and Disney had decided not to putting up, bother putting up any warning signs to alert drivers of this potentially fatal hazard. Back in the summer of 1998, three young men had been enjoying a holiday in Florida, but they then seemed to vanish off the face of the earth. As you might have been able to guess, their decomposed bodies and car were later eventually found at the bottom of Death Pond. That is so so dark. <laughs> Rumors have since circulated that several other cars and bodies were found in the haunted pond of doom on that day, although I suspect that the police probably would have noted this down somewhere. <laughs> that does sound like a bit of exaggeration. It's like, oh yeah, we found like 17 cars down there. <sighs> Let's just not write that down, shall we? It doesn't make the town look so good. <laughs> the good news is Disney did later put up a warning sign, a large wall, and flashing lights near the area. It's getting more and more dystopian, isn't it? One of the biggest problems with the weird and wonderful town of celebration is that those wildly expensive houses turned out to be just a bit sh 
it. Disney had used third-party contractors to build the houses, and they were placed under enormous pressure to get the job done quickly while adhering to all of Disney's quirky style guidelines, which slowed process down to a crawl. Ultimately, some of those contractors believed that this had led to rushed subpar construction, and many of the residents completely agreed. Early complaints about outlets not working eventually expanded into bigger problems about leaky roofs, moldy walls, and structural problems. This is not a good time, especially because like you won the lottery, you got one of these 474 houses allocated for rich white people, and then you're like, oh no, I'm a rich white person, my roof can't leak! God damn it! This is unfair! <laughs> Maximum level, Karen. Residents found themselves requesting endless repair after repair until an independent inspection was commissioned in 1999. The report concluded that Disney needed to sort out- This all happened really recently, that's only 20 years ago. <laughs> the report concluded that Disney needed to fit, sort out the flawed construction of Celebration's houses as quickly as possible, and over 70 of them required brand new roofs. There were only 400 of them. That's terrible. Uh, it must have felt a bit disappointing to splash out a fortune on your dream home in Disney Town, only, under, only to end up slumming it like a dirty peasant. Some residents were also disappointed later when Disney Disney abandoned their town in 2004. After pulling in all the profits from the sale of the houses, the company uh, was left in a position where it didn't seem worth bothering carrying on with any ownership of the town. Their continued investment in the town had naturally shrunk, and with the sale of every house and bit of land, until Disney eventually considered the job was done and it was time to walk away with the profits. I mean, yeah, this has got to be their business plan all along, because once people have bought the houses, I'm sure there's going to be some residence fees or whatever. But like the bulk of your profits have been made. Just gonna keep selecting music for the speakers for free. Also, that the the residence fees in this place must be enormous. Uh, they sold the town to the private investment firm Lexin Capital for a reported forty-two million dollars. Lexin Capital sounds like a supervillain's firm. <laughs> Although Disney included a stipulation in the deal that Lexin must uphold the same design and building standards of the town, many residents felt that Disney had sold them a dream and then just buggered off into the sunset with all of their money. Uh, allegedly, uh, I mean. Allegedly, that, that seems like exactly what they did, doesn't it? Allegedly. Disney are quite litigious, allegedly, so uh, let's be cautious. But of course, the Disney brands will always be associated with celebration, allegedly, even though some of the more recent scandals to hit the headlines might make them want to distance themselves from the town completely. In 2010, celebration had been hit hard by the economic downturn, and they had very little to celebrate. The first sign that all was not well came with the sudden, unexpected closure of the movie theater. It's prescient, isn't it? A focal point of the town, the 527-seat theater. Wait, they were originally going to build a domed place? This would be... Disney should have built this. This would be perfect now. Everyone would be like, get in the dome. Don't let anyone in. Let's seal it off. Seal off the dome! The focal point of this town, the 527-seat theater, was a beautiful 1950s-style construction with round spires and twin round marquees and had lived up to Disney's original promise of showing cartoons every Saturday morning. It was often wrongly reported that the theater only showed Disney fluff. That wasn't true. But it did have tight restrictions on showing anything more daring than a PG-rated film, so Quentin Tarantino wasn't likely to get any films shown in celebration yet. This is what would piss me off. If I'm an adult man, I want to have a glass of wine in the cinema and watch a Quentin Tarantino movie. I'm not a giant Quentin Tarantino fan, but you get, you get my picture. You get what I'm talking about. No one wants this. We're adults. We want to drink and watch movies with blood. This is possibly one of the many reasons why the theater never managed to make a profit, as it obviously missed out on many of the year's big blockbuster movies, uh, if there was likely to be a hint of bad language or violence or gore. The building still stands in celebration, but has been pretty much left to rot and decay, but the former po focal point of the town is now an embarrassing eye store. <laughs> Property prices have also plummeted with the rest of Florida, after enjoying a peak average value of $712,000. God damn! Homeowners now found that the value of their property had plummeted by about six. Percent. Oh, that is painful. In one six month period alone, almost half of the house sales in the town were foreclosures. Oh my god, that is absolutely disastrous. That is, uh, and well, at least I mean, is it just gonna now become a sh? But celebration was just about to be it for something even more gruesome in 2010. <laughs> The town's first murder. Look, I don't know about you, and I don't want to put, like, murder being like, but hundreds of people live here. Someone gets murdered. I'll be like, yeah, that murder sucks, but I'm going to be a whole lot more thinking about the 60% value that my house has lost. Because I'm a terrible person. Welcome to Business Place. We introduced at the beginning the fact that I am a dick. On 29th of November, a 58-year-old retired teacher called Matteo Giovendito, who lived alone with his pet chihuahua, was found to have been strangled with a shoelace and then bludgeoned to death with an axe in his bed. Holy fuck, this ain't some... I thought it would be like murder. It's like, yeah, husband stabbed his wife, wife stabbed husband, something like that. No, no, no. This dude was axe murdered in his bed. Some godfather sh**. 
I've never seen The Godfather, but I assume that might happen. Oh, it is a fucking surprise. Uh, the Chihuahua was unhurt. I was really worried for a second there, because I love dogs. Uh, a young homeless man by the name of David Murillo was charged with the murder, but it was later claimed by several sources that Matteo Giovendito had been a cunning pedophile predator. <laughs> Now, who had got away with abusing boys in the school for years. Oh my god, okay. No wonder they didn't want kids walking to school. <laughs> Allegedly, David was around. Not David, sorry. <laughs> Matteo was around. Oh! David Murillo claimed in his defense that Matteo had been making aggressive sexual advances on him the night before the bludgeoning, but this doesn't really explain why David went on to ransack the house and pour many of Matteo's valuable items before he was arrested. He was found guilty of the more lenient charge of second degree murder, but still received a life sentence. Okay, wait, so he did murder him, and we don't know if Matteo was a pedophile. That just seems to be allegedly okay one of Mateo's neighbors who worked at an estate agent uh, selling celebration homes business is probably bad uh, actually tried putting a positive spin on the story she said one murder in 14 years where can you go on this entire planet and find that statistic tell me a couple of days after the murder i got a call from a man up in new york he said he'd seen it on the tv news he said that's a great little town one murder in 14 years that's a good record i want to buy a condo down there i wonder why i should say that maybe she's biased because she sells the homes in the town. Jesus. She may have had something resembling a point, but it was soured by an entirely unrelated police standoff which occurred less than 10 days later. Uh. A former transatlantic jet pilot called Craig Fushi had been enduring a difficult year following a divorce and the bankruptcy of his business. With his, when his estranged wife alerted the police to the fact that Craig had threatened to kill himself, they arrived at his house to find that he was armed and barricaded himself in. Oh my god. Celebration went into lockdown for 14 hours as the soothing sounds of fake birds were disturbed by the fierce buzzing of helicopters and SWAT teams. So, hang on. A suicidal guy barricades himself in a house. He doesn't have any hostages. Why do they need to, like, why do you need a SWAT team? Just be like, dude, come out or don't come out. It's up to you, bro. I'm a gay dude. Wait, you don't get a SWAT team if someone's threatening to throw themselves off a bridge. You get, like, some dude who's gonna talk him down. What's going on? Oh my god, and then he starts taking pot shots at the SWAT team as they try to get access to the house, but nobody was seriously injured. Wait, is someone in there with him? It doesn't say. I assume not, right? What the f***? SWAT is that so extreme? Apart from Craig, after sending in a robot to assess the situation, the SWAT team eventually discovered that Craig had carried out his threat to kill himself with his own gun in Disney's Utopian Tower. So why did the SWAT team need to get need to risk getting shot? What the? F the dramas continue to unfold as recently as 2020. A Connecticut physical therapist by the name of Anthony Todd T O D T Todd Todd is alleged to have killed his wife and three children in their celebration home, and this time the family dog didn't escape the massacre. Dude. Uh, the local police were initially asked to check in on the house by uh, the previous December by a family friend who hadn't seen them in a while. Nobody appeared to be in when the police called rounds, so they saw no reason to pursue the matter. It wasn't until months later that they forced their way inside to find Anthony Todd hiding upstairs, surrounded by the decomposing bodies of his family. Fucking hell. I, I, uh, that's not, no, there's no jokes to be made. That is just, what the f Bro. Although he confessed the killings, he now seems to have changed his mind and claimed that it was his wife who killed the children before killing herself. The case rumbles on, so he still had time to change his mind again and blame Mickey Mouse. Oh, dude, that is not right. But scandals and murders and suicides aside, was Celebration really a failed town for Disney? I mean, no, they, they sold all the houses, they were kind of sh they took their money and run. I'm not so sure. Disney did all right out of the town. They were reported to have made a profit around $550 million from the whole venture, which may sound a bit small for I for Disney, but it's still not a bad profit from developing a bit of land that they've been sitting on for decades. Around 8,000 residents still seem happy enough to live in celebration today, and the town certainly helped to bump up Osceola Lucio Services County's tax revenue. I'm not convinced that Lex in Capital did that well out of the deal. Although the standard of houses is said to have improved in recent years, the current owners of celebration are still swamped by regular complaints, which can be traced back to Disney's original rust construction of the houses. Lexing capital on the hook for this? I feel like if I buy a house and it starts leaking, I can't be like, hey, you sold me the house, it's leaking. <laughs> Fix it. They'll be like, you bought the house, it's your problem now. <laughs> Isn't that how law works? <laughs> it's probably been years. It's been years. <laughs> Decades. Maybe Disney failed in the sense that Celebration was meant to be a template for the perfect community of the future, which other towns and cities could learn from. <laughs> what they actually created was a slightly creepy bubble town with a terrible school, lack of diversity, a death bond, stifling rules and regulations, expensive houses with leaking roofs, and nutty residents venturing far too deep down the rabbit hole. <laughs> All against the jolly background noise of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer blaring out of the palm trees. I'm not sure how much of that would have been featured in Walt Disney's original storyboard. Oh my god, this should be a movie. Like, this should def- this should be a movie about this sh 
It's so crazy. Uh, or maybe there's an awesome documentary about it or something, because, you know, obviously here we provide some facts, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of half assed Whoa, this has been Business Blaze. Please go check out Babbel, today's sponsor, if you would like to support the show and get some awesome language learning chops. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.